find that painting, would you, by Tissot? He's a French artist, um, 19th century French artist. This rendition of um, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Take a good long look at it. And then tell me. Got him? Got him, got him. Pass him around, choir. Take a good long look. <clears throat> Tell me, what do you see? What do you notice? Humility with the tax collector. How do we know which one is the tax collector? Oh, his head's down. He's showing remorse. Whereas the Pharisee... Oh, he is literally... The artist has done a good job. He is literally in the limelight, says Curtis. Yes. He what? Yes. Oh, such a good detail to notice. L look at the Pharisee's feet. His heels are literally off the ground. He is rising up. It's as if we can almost hear the, the script, the way it's written. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. All these other people. What else do you see? What do you notice about the painting? He is well-dressed. He's wearing a prayer shawl. It's how we can identify him as, um, as the Pharisee, as the keeper of the law. He's in his official clothes. You see what? You see arrogance. And frustration. On the part of whom? The tax collector. Yeah, Pat, just notice that. Look, take a look at the tax collector. Notice how his knee is bent. Notice how, I think if that, if that post wasn't there, he might fall down. He's leaning. Oh, he's totally leaning. Can't stand up on his own two feet. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Well, and we know that here in the temple, right, the, the Pharisee has stepped far into proximity of the Holy of Holies. The tax collector barely has one foot there. What else do you notice? <laughs> that is a fancy church. Yes, ma'am. It sure is. <laughs> Take a good long look at the painting. Where do you see yourself in the story? Maybe your answer is different today than it would have been yesterday or than it will be tomorrow. Where do you see yourself? in the story. As we prepare for the word preached, I would invite you to hold that wooden heart again in your hands and let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is time once again for true confessions of your pastor. This happened to me whenever I was in high school. I'm sitting in Mr. Gobert's government class. He let us sit wherever we wanted, and so my friends were sitting on this side of the classroom. All of the football players and their friends and girlfriends were sitting on that side of the classroom. The folks who were kind of in the middle of the social spectrum, they were sitting in the middle of the classroom. And one of the 
football players went on this rant about Anita Hill and how he just thought she was full of it. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody in the room remembers who Anita Hill was. She was the person who accused um, Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment when she was a law student. This football player just went on and on and on and on and on about how he thought she just was ridiculous and that she, and he didn't believe a word that she said. Meanwhile, over here on my side of the classroom where I was sitting with my friends, my friend Matt turned around and looked at me and said, are you going to say something? <laughs> so I sat there for a moment and I raised my hand and Mr. Gobert standing in the front of the classroom <laughs> looked at Brian <laughs> and kind of laughed and then looked at me and said, go. And he went and sat down at his desk. <laughs> Do you remember watching Designing Women? Do you remember those moments in Designing Women when somebody would, um, would insult Julia Sugarbaker or someone that she loved? I was like the Julia Sugarbaker of Jasper High School. And I opened my mouth and I skewered that kid. I absolutely eviscerated him. So much so that whenever I saw a bunch of my high school friends at a wedding this summer, one of them brought that moment up. He remembered. He was like, that was awesome. You took him down. And I wasn't wrong. I mean, that's the thing, right? I wasn't wrong. I wasn't wrong. Take a look at your painting, would you? Who do I look like in the painting? Let me get my heels up off the ground. <sighs> this is a thing. Pharisee wasn't wrong. He's the keeper of the law. If anybody knows the right thing to do, it's the Pharisee. If anybody knows the right way to do it, it's the keeper of the law. He's done everything right. He fasts. He tithes. He comes to the temple and he prays. Ah, oh, but he does it with such contempt. And in doing it with such contempt, even though he's followed all of the rules, he still missed the point because he's followed all of the rules except for two, and they're the two most important of those rules, of the law, of the way in which we're supposed to be in this world in order to make the world a reflection of the kingdom of God. Those two most important rules, first, love God with your whole self, with your whole body and mind and strength. And the second, love your neighbor the way you love yourself. So it's fairly easy whenever we read this parable, it's fairly easy to see how he's missed that second rule. Clearly, he is not loving his neighbor the way that he loves himself. We can hear it in the way he compares himself and places himself higher than his neighbor, who is literally standing there with him. God, I thank you like I'm not like those other people, thieves and rogues and adulterers, or even, even like this tax collector. I'm so glad, God. Thank you. Thank you for not making me like him. 
It's about the least loving thing that he can say, yes? Oh, but it's so easy to do. It's so easy to do that, especially when we know we're right. I mean, obviously, thieves, rogues, adulterers, and the tax collectors who stole from people all the time, they're so wrong, right? They're so wrong. Thank you, God, that we're not like those people who clearly are so wrong. Perhaps you've heard people say that in this current political season. Thank you, God, that we're not like those people who are so wrong. That's how he breaks the second of the most important of the laws. But take a look at your text. Would you pull it out if you don't have it? Where, where is it? Where does it say that he's not loving God? I mean, that's strange, right? Because in the next sentence, he says, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of my income. This is kind of a dangerous passage to preach during stewardship season, by the way. Where is it? Oh, and then we remember. <laughs> we remember that the clue is actually in the introduction to the story. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You see, the evidence that the tax collector isn't loving God with his whole heart, with his whole mind, with his whole self, the evidence of that is in the introduction. Because Jesus is telling the story to people who trust in themselves rather than trusting first and foremost in God. Self-righteousness is the original sin of the self-satisfied and people who are confident in their own abilities. I'm going to say that line again because it's the one that I certainly need to hear, usually on a daily basis. Self-righteousness is, is the original sin of people who are self-satisfied and of people who are confident in their own abilities. When you're the kind of person who knows how to get stuff done and knows how to problem solve and and who's confident in themselves, right? When you're the kind of person who knows how to navigate life, it's so easy to go and do in your own name and in the process to distance our, ourselves from anyone who's not like us. But that's not what we are called to do and to be. We're called to be the and in go and do. We cannot go and do in this world by ourselves. We need one another. Moreover, we're called to be in relationship with people, even people who don't like us very much and people who we don't like as well. We're called by God to be in relationship with them. We're called to be the and. We're called not to trust so much in ourselves, but to trust in those life-giving ways of Jesus that intertwine us with God and with each other until thy kingdom comes. And so you're invited this week to take this heart home with you again Last week, you were called to carry it around with you and to hand it to someone who you, who you thought was about to lose heart. That's what last week's story was about. But this week, this week is about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the worship team, we talked about this 
I'm looking at Ilsa because she was part of those meetings. We talked about what it is that we wanted you to do with this, the, with this heart. And we did have a moment where we said, oh, yeah, this week, this week we should, maybe we should hand it to somebody who's like falling into self-righteousness. And then we had this moment where we thought, there's going to be some poor person who's like, somebody handed me a billion hearts this week. And <laughs> that seems uh, like not the best use of the hearts. <clears throat> because once we start looking at other people and saying, oh, you're being self-righteous, then we're being the Pharisee. See how that works? Now, it's more important for us to hold on to this heart. As a reminder, we're supposed to be trusting in God more than we trust in ourselves. So you're invited to take this home with you, and when you have a moment of being like the Pharisee, when you start to utter the, thank you God that I am not like those people prayer, which is very easy to do, especially in this current election season, hold on to that heart even tighter. And if you're the kind of person who carries a you know, a cell phone with a camera on it, you're invited to snap a picture of where you are at that moment. Maybe the picture is just for yourself. Or maybe you want to post the picture on social media. Hashtag heart homework. As a way to remind yourself. We're called to be the and in go and do. Not to put up walls between us and other people with our own self-righteousness, but to be in deeper and deeper relationship with folks. It's the only way, it's the only way the ki that the kingdom of God comes. Amen. You'll see in your bulletin that silent meditation is now um, altering call you're invited to take this moment of silence to ponder what you have heard and experienced during worship. How have you been altered? Maybe write some notes in your bulletin or pray. There are some crayons in the back. You could grab some of those. I will also be down here if you would like someone to pray with you. I would gladly do that. So let's take a moment now to gather our hearts and minds, and to be in silent meditation. <clears throat> 